When you look through a catalog of courses at almost any college or university, you'll find that when you look at the subjects in that catalog, you'll find a commonality among many of the disciplines. They all end in the same way, with an ology. In the natural sciences, there are subjects like biology, physiology, and geology. In the social sciences, you'll find psychology, sociology, and anthropology. In the humanities, sometimes you'll see something like philology, which is the study of language and words. The ending of each of these words has that same Greek root, logos, which can mean a few different things, but they're all kind of related. It can mean knowledge of something, or organization of something, or the study of something. And all of these meanings are probably appropriate in one way or another for the title of that discipline. However, if you've been teaching in the sciences for as long as I have, you'll notice that there seem to be a few things that don't really match that pattern. Physics and chemistry, for example. Physics is so named because it's taken from a Greek word, meaning motion or change, and chemistry comes from the Egyptian word for black earth. But the biggest standout, I think, is astronomy. Why isn't this called astrology in parallel with biology and geology? Well, as you may have already guessed, there was already a subject known as astrology when the scientific discipline began to come together. So what's the difference? Don't both have to do with the study of the heavens? Well, yes and no. The two subjects do share a good bit in common, but what is true here also is that they purport to do or uncover vastly different things. Every teacher of astronomy has a story that goes something like this. They have their first class period, and while going over the syllabus, one of two things happens. Either they just come out and say that the course is not an astrology course, or a student will ask why there isn't a section of the syllabus or a section of the course devoting to casting or writing horoscopes to which the teacher has to explain that the course is one on astronomy, not astrology. It's an honest mistake, but it invariably leads to a certain number of the students not coming back after the first day. So why don't you find courses on astrology in college catalogs, at least most college catalogs, and why is it so important to make the distinction between two so similarly named subjects? Well, it has to do with something we talked about at the beginning of this series, and that is, what makes a science a science? It is generally held among the scientific community that astrology is not a scientific discipline because it fails some of the criteria that we've laid out. However, given its adjacency to astronomy and the claims made by some of its adherents that it is in fact a scientific discipline, it turns out that very often it's referred to as something called a pseudoscience. This of course leads us to the topic of this episode. What is a pseudoscience and how can one distinguish a pseudoscience from something that's scientific? And, of course, if you've been working through this series of episodes, you probably already have a good idea of a couple of things that will be useful in accomplishing our task. Critical thinking and evidence. What we'll try to do over the course of the next, oh, I don't know, 45 minutes or so, is see if we can hone in on some of the specifics and spend a little bit of time talking about philosophy of science so that we can distinguish science from pseudoscience. Hello, and welcome to the Scientific Odyssey. The Scientific Odyssey is a mini-part journey into the history and philosophy of science. My name is Chad Davies, and I'm the writer, host, and producer of the podcast, where we consider the ideas, processes, and results of over 2,500 years of scientific inquiry and discovery. Series 1, Science's Inquiry. Episode 10, Science, Pseudoscience, and Snake Oil.
So this episode continues the second part of our series here on Science's Inquiry. In the first five episodes, we looked at some of the characteristics that made the process of scientific inquiry unique compared to some other forms, as well as the, some of the ways in which scientific knowledge was acquired or is acquired, transmitted and understood from a logical point of view. After that, and an extended break to talk about things like atoms and astronomy and the problem of in induction and even some cartography, we've come back with a sort of second half of the series focused on developing and applying the tools of critical thinking. These later episodes, for those who don't know and are just sort of finding this now, were made years after the first set. Um, after a few of the students from various classes that I've taught asked me to add the material to, uh, to the series. With the outbreak of the SARS COVID-19 and virus and all of the misinformation surrounding that, I decided that it was a really good time for me to get that information out as a way of providing anyone who might come across the show some tools to help them navigate through all of the things going on around that. I thought, I thought I would sort of stop that whole second part of the series with my episode on char characteristics of conspiracy theories in no small part because I expected some pretty serious blowback after releasing the episode. However, it turns out that that episode seems to have been really well received, at least if the download numbers are to be trusted. It's one of the most popular episodes we've done in spite of being unscripted and honestly pretty rough. I shouldn't be surprised, I suppose, because you all as the crew of the Odyssey are a pretty awesome group, and maybe a lot of that episode was, as the saying goes, preaching to the choir. Yet, I also heard back from several listeners asking if I might be able to do more stuff in that same vein. They found the episode helpful in having a red flag list to work through when looking at conspiracy claims. They also liked to be able to tell their friends who were spouting off the latest 5G QAnon deep state concoction to listen and see how many of the red flags were raised in whatever particular nonsense their friends were endorsing in that particular moment. So that kind of brings us to this episode. I didn't, and I still don't, really want to dig into specific conspiracy theories, since there are already a number of really excellent podcasts that do that. But what I do have is a similar set of material for another topic I often talk about in my courses on scientific inquiry, that of pseudoscience. Given that pseudoscientific claims are just about as ubiquitous as conspiracy theories and share a lot in common with them in some ways, I thought it would be a good thing to pair this with the previous topic. The outline for this episode is to talk just a little bit about the history of the term and where it came from, move on to some of the def definitions of what pseudoscience is, and then to really talk about the difficulty of delineating a science from a pseudoscience by taking a really quick look at something known as the demarcation problem. Once we've done that, we'll see if we can use a similar approach to identifying pseudoscience as we did in examining conspiracy theories. Finally, we'll dig into why some people believe these things and what your response probably should be when you encounter, the, encounter those folks. So now that I've kind of laid that all out, let's go ahead and get started. And let's talk just a little bit about where the term pseudoscience comes from. From what I've been able to find, the first use of the word in English dates to 1796 when, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, historians James Pettit Andrew first used the word in reference to the practice of alchemy, calling it, quote, a fantastic pseudoscience, end quote. From there, the word entered the lexicon with ever-increasing frequency until it became fairly commonplace by the 1880s and has remained so since then. These days, we tend to use the term for any claim, belief, or practice that claims to be scientific but is found to be lacking in at least one of the following ways. Number one, it does not adhere to a valid process of scientific inquiry in one or more important ways. Number two, it lacks supporting evidence and or number three, cannot be reliably tested. Now, what I want you to really note here is that these are all process of scientific inquiry sorts of things as opposed to being content related things. The problem with astrology is not that it doesn't study the right things, i.e. the natural world, but rather that it seeks to establish its claims in a way that is not scientific, and that's something we're going to delve into in some detail later on in this episode. What this means for us is that if we wish to evaluate whether a subject or a field is scientific or pseudoscientific, 
we have to focus on process or method, specifically the process or method related to the evidence in support of the claim rather than the content of the claim. By the way, does that sound a little familiar? I hope that sounds a little familiar. Now, before we jump into looking at some of the common characteristics of pseudoscience, we really need to pause and ask ourselves if there's a hard and fast way to distinguish scientific stuff from non-scientific stuff. Or, to put it more technically, is there a way to demarcate types of inquiry that are scientific from those that aren't by having a specific set of criteria that must be met? In philosophy of science, this is known as the demarcation problem. And, unfortunately, there really isn't as much agreement on this as one might hope in order to answer the question or to establish these criteria. So let's start off by saying that there are those who believe that there's really no demarcation between science and any other type of inquiry. They point to a lack of a single method or process of inquiry that works in all cases as evidence that there isn't really a unique way of asking and answering questions and that any attempt to assert such a position amounts to little more than disciplinary gatekeeping or elitism. Now, before you brush this off completely, I think if one looks at the period prior to what is often called the scientific revolution, you can find that there are a lot of folks doing a lot of stuff that looks a lot like science without having some sort of organized way of asking and answering questions. One only has to think to our episode on metallurgy, where it's pretty clear that for much, if not most of history, a significant amount of the progress was either made by trial or error or through serendipitous discovery. And though we haven't really discussed it at all on the show, I think a lot could be said, you know, in the case of folk medicine, which for a lot of time had a success rate that was at least as good as that of more traditional Galenic or Islamic medicine from the medieval period. However, just because a group of practitioners are able to make progress without a defined process doesn't mean that there aren't common characteristics in how they moved forward. For example, there had to be some form of evaluating success. Is the metal harder or better able to hold an edge? Well, if it is, that means you made progress. Does the person to whom the treatment is applied get better or at least not get worse? Well, if that's the case, then that means that treatment is, at least isn't bad. This all requires some gathering and evaluation of evidence. In these cases, physical observations. Moreover, while there are those that reject the idea that science is a unique form of inquiry, their views aren't generally shared by the practitioners of that form of inquiry or by most others who evaluate that inquiry from the outside. In other words, I think it's fair to say that the vast majority of those engaged in scientific inquiry would say that there are unique characteristics in the way they do the work that are not found in other areas of inquiry. In other words, most scientists will say that the activities they participate in to answer questions are very different qualitatively than those who seek to answer questions regarding things, say, like morality or legality. Even if those activities are hard to separate out in some cases, discounting this broad consensus of experience is, to put it mildly, rather problematic. Just because coming up with demarcation criteria that work in all cases is hard doesn't mean that there aren't ways to distinguish scientific activity from non-scientific activity. Therefore, I think we can go back to some of those characteristics that we outlined in the first couple of episodes of this series. For inquiry to be considered scientific, I think it's fair that it's to say that it has to focus on the physical universe, it has to be empirical, and it has to result in descriptions of the systems that are predictive towards the behavior of those systems. Note, these may not be enough to make clear distinctions between things that are scientific and those that are pseudoscientific in every case, but I do think they form a really good foundation. For example, let's consider astrology just a bit for further. Astrology makes a couple of claims in terms of its inquiry. First, it claims that the positions of the planets with respect to defined patterns of stars in the sky at the time of a person's birth, note, that's usually not the time of a person's conception, determine, at least in part, aspects of a person's personality. Second, it also claims that those determining characteristics can interact with ongoing influences from those same planets throughout a person's life to affect a person's personality or, and or their prospects at a specific later time. As such, 
It is important that the positions of the planets be well established both at the time of a person's birth and then when considering the person's future, future prospects. For example, if we go back to the medieval period in Europe and we consider a decision being considered, say, by some baron about whether he wants to invade his neighbor to seize his land to enrich himself or enlarge his claims. If he had the wherewithal to do so, he might hire an astrologer to cast or make a horoscope. To do so, the astrologer would need to know both the baron's date of birth and then also when the baron is considering invading his neighbor. With this information, the astrologer would then establish the positions of the planets at each of those times and come up with a horoscope which would give a recommendation as to the best course of action. In another case, by the early modern period, it was assumed that the state of a person's physical health was influenced by the positions of the planets, and so a physician would often determine a horoscope for a patient to see if there were contributing factors on a cosmological scale that would adversely affect that patient's health. It was in this way, by the way, that Copernicus was trained extensively in astronomical ideas in the late 1400s. He was training to be a medical student and so require, was required to know enough astronomy to be able to, if not cast horoscopes, at least be able to interpret them to treat his patients. So the question is, in these contexts, does astrology meet our three criteria? Well, there is at least some part of, portion of the inquiry concerned with the physical universe. While the idea of a planet during each of these times was very different from what we conceive of them being now, they were considered to be a part of the physical universe. As we have gained in our astronomical knowledge over the century, this has certainly become more the case. While the mechanism of how the influence is not well understood or explained in astrology, either then or now, that may not be really all that big of a barrier. Newton himself didn't actually know the mechanism for gravity when he posited his universal law of gravitation, and yet still he went forward and made incredible scientific progress. Now, can the inquiry, if it's astrology, be thought to have empirical aspects? Yes, I think so. We can make observations using our senses to determine the positions of the planets, and we can also do the same thing to determine the outcomes of the actions taken by the individuals as a response to the recommendations made by the horoscopes. Does the baron invade or not? If so, does he prevail in the battle? Does the condition of the patient improve? These, I think, are empirically establishable things. Finally, is astrology predictive? And I would say, well, yes, in its purest form it is. It makes predictions about future outcomes, at least some of the time, and we'll come back and talk a little bit about that. As such, astrology, at least according to the present demarcation criteria we've listed, should be considered scientific. Of course, according to most individuals that consider such things, it's not thought to be a scientific form of inquiry, and so it seems like we need something more. One such criterion was developed by Karl Popper, and we've kind of mentioned this in the past, and that is this idea known as falsifiability. This is an additional or strengthening, strengthening piece to the prediction criterion. What it says that is, is that if a hypothesis is going to make a prediction about a behavior of a system, then that prediction has to be able to be proven false. We talked about this in that first series of episodes in this, or first set of episodes in this series. So, returning to our example, Let's say that the horoscope for our baron tells him that invading his neighbor is a bad idea and that he's likely to suffer defeat. The baron, however, being headstrong and forceful, let's hope his horoscope predicted that, by the way, decides to invade anyway and wins the battle. Now, this would seem to show that astrology, using whatever predictive criteria it had, say Venus being dominant in a peaceful constellation, made a poor prediction. Now, there are three ways to go once you encounter a failure like this. One is to say that astrology is not a good predictive framework and thus fails as a form of inquiry. Okay, that's a typical thing. You have a hypothesis, the hypothesis makes a prediction, the prediction's inaccurate, you reject the hypothesis. Great. Another is to say that astrology as a principle is okay, but that the specific instance of application was flawed either because the practitioner was inept or because the fundamental interpretive principles were wrong. Venus in that constellation doesn't override the fact that the Moon and Mars were close together at the time of the Baron's birth, 
let's say, right? And so that's a case where maybe you've got to do hypothesis modification. Or finally, you can say that there are other non-astrological factors that came into play that couldn't be taken into account by the horoscope. Now, which of these three ex explanations fail on terms of the falsifiability criterion? Well, it turns out that only the third one was. If there's a bunch of stuff that we can't take into account and therefore is not subject to testing and falsification, then astrology really can't be considered to be scientific. As we've said before, that doesn't mean it can't make predictions and the like. It just means that we won't consider those predictions to be scientific ones. The other two, however, are okay. Now, the first would be to admit that astrology can't do what it claims, i.e. make reliable predictions either about a person's personality or future events. That doesn't make it unscientific, it just makes it wrong. The history of science is littered with all of these beautiful ideas that have been slain by ugly facts. We talk about an example of this in Season 2 with the phlogiston theory. With that middle explanation, though, things get a little bit more complicated, and it can be useful here to have another demarcation criteria. And that would be that valid scientific inquiry makes progress towards solving problems. Let's say that the second case were true. The horoscope failed because there are factors that were either inaccurately applied or poorly understood. This happens sometimes, especially with complex systems. The thing is, is as you add more and more empirical data, as you gather more and more of that, you would expect that the predictive ability of astrology would measurably improve and that rules and laws determined to govern the interactions in astrology would become better known and more correct in their predictions. Again, if you look at the history of several disciplines in science, you see this kind of prediction. The, the predictions in that discipline maybe start off by being wrong as often as they are right, but as more data gets gathered and more kinds of situations are looked at and tested, progress is made in be better, developing better predictive tools and better models, i.e. better laws and hypotheses and theories, those sorts of things. And here's where astrology, I think, really reveals itself as a pseudoscience. If you look at the accuracy of predictions over time, there just doesn't seem to be any improvement in terms of accuracy. At least accuracy that's in, you know, that independent research puts at basically, you know, being above the, the level of, you know, dart throwing or guessing or something like that. Astrology just doesn't ever seem to be better than doing that. Even as more planets and other astronomical objects have been discovered, something that one might expect would lead to greater accuracy, the discipline still isn't able to make consistently accurate predictions of things regarding, de regarding human personality or human behavior. What's just as troubling about the subject is that the methods of casting a valid horoscope seem to be as varied as the number of practitioners. There just don't seem to be a lot of what might be thought of as general principles or methods that everybody in the discipline of astrology agrees on. There are no sort of conservation of energy type statements that everyone uses as the foundation of their analysis. Can you imagine if chemistry did this? One chemist said that electron interactions are important for binding and another discounting that idea and saying that their pet principle or practice was more accurate with seemingly no real way to test between the two. Anyway, I think you sort of get it where I'm going at with this. The demarcation problem is a tough one to work through, and at some point we'll do a few episodes on it to really dig down into this idea. But for now, let's assume that there is such a thing as a demarcated type of scientific inquiry based on some of these ideas and see that how they can help us understand dealing with pseudoscience. In health news today, Atlanta, Georgia-based company Active Health Solutions announced the discovery of Ion Water, a new health water product the company claims will provide a number of benefits for people who drink it. The company's chief science officer, Peter Culligan, explains how the product works. Quote, Using magnetic resonance technology, Active Health Solutions has found a way to energize regular bottled water. 
Using our patented active ion technology, which is able to infuse dihydrogen monoxide with electrolytically generated nanobubbles, we have created a product that completely revolutionizes the way our bodies interact with and utilize water. Active Ion uses tetrahedral mathematics-based technology utilizing virtual lasers to achieve the resonance. End quote. Company founder Dion Williams pointed to ancient Greek mythology as the inspiration for the product. He said, quote, We know that the Oracle of Olympus was situated near a group of hot springs that was electrically active. It is well established that the ancient Greek athletes paid enormous sums of money to visit the Oracle and drink the spring water in preparation for the Olympic Games. We surmised that the combination of electrical activity in the area and the heated and heavily mineralized water would cause an ionization of the hydrogen in the water to produce a form of hydrogen we now call active hydrogen. End quote. Former Olympic hopeful Leon Ryan has been using a prototype of the product for about six months. The product is simply amazing, enthused the one-time competitive bobsledder. I've never had anything quite like it. When I drink ion water, I feel like I have more energy and focus. My concentration is better, and it seems like things really slow down. This product is so effective that I'm seriously considering getting back into bobsledding and trying to make the 2022 Olympic team. If it worked for the first Olympians, it should work for me and for anyone else who wants to do better in their jobs or their athletic endeavors. Ryan says that drinking the water has improved his performance by over 100%, which is in line with the company's claims that those who use the product will double their ability to transport oxygen to normally oxygen-starved tissues in the body, which should easily double mental acuity and bodily function. When asked if any other scientists had reviewed Active Health Solutions research, Dr. Culligan said that the technology the company uses is proprietary and thus can't be divulged until patent applications have been reviewed and resolved. He said that the company has done extensive testing of the product internally and that dozens of athletes and executives have been using the product with surprisingly positive results. Quote, I think that people who try our product will be really surprised as to its effectiveness. We've managed to harness the Earth's etheric energy to create a new form of structured water heretofore unknown to humanity, end quote. When pressed about performing clinical trials, Dr. Culligan explained, quote, When the technology and active ion is robust enough to be moved out of our labs, we'll be happy to let it run, let anyone run trials using it. Right now, we're fairly certain that the technology will only work properly in locations with a strong magnetic field anomaly, and so we would have to find other sites that replicate that, end quote. Mr. Williams continued, quote, This is really a whole package of technologies and discoveries. You can't just take pieces and parts of it and test them without disturbing the integrity of the entire process, end quote. Ion Water will be sold in stores in the Atlanta area beginning November 1st at a price of $4.99 a 16-ounce bottle. In the words of Williams, I think you'll find the price more than reasonable once you've experienced the benefits of aerobic oxygen. So the blurb you just heard was taken from about a, a 2012 quiz I used to give my science, pseudoscience, and snake oil students that was attended, intended to sort of assess their ability to look for red flags in pseudoscientific claims. You can probably imagine my surprise when a product with that exact same name was later introduced to the market. And I should be really careful here to point out that any and all similarities between my fictional press release that you just heard and the marketing materials one might find, you know, associated with a similarly named or any similar product are purely coincidental. Nevertheless, it is somewhat amazing how often life imitates art, isn't it? What's just as interesting is how often you can find products with marketing materials that are just slightly less extreme than this. Every semester, my students would bring me examples of ads for products that were being sold to unsuspecting company, com customers that were like this, including one, and I am not making this up, a hair care product that first had a claim of using antimatter as part of the formulation for the hair care product and that was then changed to be instead some nano ferromagnetic material due to mocking comments on that product's Amazon reviews. Now, there are those who will wring their hands and bemoan the, the scientific illiteracy or the gullibility of today's population, but 
you know, just to kind of put things in perspective, one must remember that P.T. Barnum's famous adage was coined over a century ago, and history is filled with con artists selling patent medicine cures to those selling relief from all sorts of ailments going back as far as we can, we can look. For those looking for musical inspiration for such kinds of things, I might recommend Mark Knopfler's wonderful tune, Stand Up Guy, for Miss Shangri-La album. It really does put a lot of this in perspective. Folks are folks, people are people. We've been doing the same kinds of things all along. So what I thought I'd do at this point is with that fictional press relief release as background is see if we can come up with some ways to identify pseudoscientific claims and distinguish them from scientific ones. As we did with conspiracy theories, the approach we're going to follow here is to use Wittgenstein's idea of family or familial similarities. Not every pseudoscience is going to have the exact same set of issues or problems, but we can look at a set of characteristics that many of them share and sort of use them as red flags. Not every pseudoscientist is going to have every one of these things that we're going to list, but the more of them that you identify in a claim, the more skeptical of that claim you should be, just like we did with conspiracy theories. And by the way, as we go through these, perhaps you'll see some of them reflected in the Ion Water press release that we just went through. And to be clear here, what we're really doing is sort of looking at a tool that helps us identify a claim being made by some party that something is scientific. And we're trying to determine whether that claim can be scientific, pseudoscientific, or if it's snake oil. And I do always throw that last category in when talking with students to distinguish between something that is merely claiming to be scientific but isn't to something that's actually truly harmful. For example, I don't think that reading one's horoscope on a social media site for entertainment purposes is really all that harmful. However, once a person decides to make employment, financial, or personal relationship decisions based on the belief that astrology is scientific valid, scientifically valid, well, then maybe it does become harmful and it goes from being just pseudoscience into snake oil. The more pernicious are the people who sell all sorts of products that they claim substitute for actual, scientifically verified medical treatments by claiming, you know, some kind of scientific validity for the product when none, in fact, actually exists. This is when pseudoscience truly becomes harmful. All right, so with that said, let's get on with the list. The first red flag is that the claim has an outward appearance of science, but when investigated more deeply, isn't all that scientific. And some of the things you want to look for is that the claim uses language that sounds scientific, but then when you sort of look at that language, you realize that it's vague, it's undefined, it's exaggerated, or it's contradictory. You know, look for the frequent misuse of scientific terms. You know, things like nano this or quantum that. Those are really popular right now. Okay, when a claim makes predictions, you might find that they're also fairly vague or undefined, i.e. they're really hard to verify. They might even be contradictory if they're multiple, multiple practitioners. This is a big thing you see with astrology, right? A lot of times you go into astrology and it's just vague snippets of advice kinds of things like be nice to people because that'll make your day easier. Well, that's not a prediction. That's just, that's just good advice, right? Um, Another thing that you will see under this, this kind of red flag, are, are frequent changes in scientific methodology with no change in outcomes. Fad diets really fall into this category. How many of your favorite daytime shows, and I can think of, of at least a few in particular, have big name individuals who come on the show to promote a certain product or diet that claim remarkable weight loss, only to have that show within just a few weeks change to a different product or mechanisms, you know, just just off the fly, you know, you know, somebody comes in and talks about, oh, we're going to have the artichoke and asparagus diet. It's going to change your life. And oh, I just, you know, the host totally endorses this and everyone needs to try this. And three weeks later, they're on there with somebody else who has a completely different diet that works, you know, all of those kinds of things. That's usually a really big, big red flag. Okay, red flag number two, and this is something that shows up in an awful lot. Of what we talk about is the absence of skeptical peer review. We talked about the process of scientific communication at some length in one of our earlier episodes and why it's so important for assuring scientific reliability. If the subject matter that's claiming to be scientific has an absence of this, that should be a huge red flag. 
Okay, and what you'll oftentimes see in association with that is there's little skepticism showed by the adherence of the uh, the claim, right? Um, and that generally means that there's no level of peer review. You know, if you contrast this, you know, in physics, one of the things that you know you can sort of say, well, gee. You know, if you look at the Hubble constant, for example, when Hubble first proposes that, there's this huge range of numbers, and there's this giant fight that happens in the scientific journals over the course of several generations of scientists, and then as data comes in, that number gets, you know, gets tighter and tighter and closer and closer to where we have a pretty good idea of what that number is based on Hubble Space Telescope um, observations now. But there was tons of peer review and there was tons of back and forth in the literature. Even, a, you know, among the people who were adherents to an expanding universe, there was still significant skepticism expressed by those individuals. Now, if there is a publication, that publication will often claim um, supporting evidence and you know, or just make the claims and not make them available for public review through external journals or conferences. They're all going to be internal things. You're going to say, oh, we have all the evidence for this. And then it just is never shown to anybody. Those are all just great, big, huge flags. Um, another case of this would be the reliance on personal experience. The idea of lots of endorsements or anecdotal claims, right? Um, the idea here is that those things are not the same as controlled experiments. Those are not evidence. Okay. Um, and one thing that, I, you know, it, it's out there a lot, of, you know, and it's, it's this thing that you've probably heard and the plural, that is the plural of anecdote is not data. Just because you have 10 people who tell this story of how great this thing is, that's not data, right? It's just, nothing's controlled about that. It's all based on their personal experience. It may be something that says, okay, wait a minute, maybe we need to go do a study on this, but those those claims, those, those testimonials shouldn't be treated as evidence. The other thing is, of course, you'll see in this a strong reliance on personal experience and thus subjective validation. James did X and then Y happened. And therefore, what you'll see is in the, in the advertisements for stuff like this or just in the, in the literature for stuff like this, therefore, X must lead to Y in every, every case. And the logical fallacy for this is, of course, hasty generalization. Um, generally in this, you'll see a, a real lack of quantitative data. Um, you'll see strong or very, very small sample sizes with strong conclusions or correlations um, that are drawn. Um, a really great example of this that I used with my students is on, on a case like this was a, a study that was done looking at um, something called telomere length and lifestyle. And so if you, you know a little bit about genetics, you may have heard about this. This came out, you know, several years ago now, I guess probably five or six years ago, is the end caps on the ends of your DNA are called telomeres. And probably the best um, analogy I've ever heard of, of, of this to sort of understand these is these are sort of like when you have shoelaces. If the shoelace is like the DNA, you have those little plastic caps on the end that keep the shoelace from unraveling. And those are known as telomeres. And telomere length, telomeres can be longer or shorter. And it turns out the shorter the telomere length is, the more likely DNA is to be damaged and there to be negative health outcomes associated with that. And so a group out of uh, the University of California in San Francisco, plus a couple of other institutions, did a really interesting study where they had people make a variety of, of four different lifestyle changes and studied what happened to the telomere lengths. Um, they would, you know, they would, they would take DNA from the people and they would look at the telomere lengths and all of that. And what they found out was, is that, you know, if you did certain things, you had some sort of a, like a the Mediterranean style diet. If you, you participated in exercise, you did some meditation, you made sure you got a little extra sleep. You did some of those sorts of things. The more that you did, the longer your telomeres were. Now, the thing that was really interesting, the paper got published and, and Ornish was the lead author, if I remember correctly, and it, it got a lot of press. The study was published and it was a perfectly good scientific study. But the thing that was really interesting is the scientific study, the number of participants, I want to say was somewhere around 40 individuals um, who, who participated in the study. And there were about 20 who did the uh, activity and there were 20 who didn't. They were all individuals who had, you know, what was called maintenance colon cancer or, or excuse me, maintenance prostate cancer. And what they found out was, is that, yeah, this is what happened in the 20 people who participated in the, uh, the intervention activities, their telomere length started, stayed longer, indicating that perhaps they might better have, have better health outcomes. The conclusion of the paper was 
Boy, this certainly is intriguing, and we think it bears further study, but we draw no conclusions further than that. If you went out to media, now I will say, you know, mainstream media, places like, you know, CNN, Forbes, um, you know, on those kinds of places, they all kind of basically stated that this is, this was what the study was, but you didn't have to go very far away from that to get into some pretty wild claims outside of that saying, oh, look, they did this study. You can live forever. If you do these things, your DNA will never degrade, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then you began to get the stuff that was really wild, which is they were selling supplements to lengthen your telomere length. All of this stuff you know, the original paper drew no strong conclusions or correlations, absolutely scientific work. All of the stuff after that, who drew all of these super strong correlations, that's all pseudoscientific right there. Um, another thing that you'll see in this, I kind of move along with this is part of the same thing, but um, in this, you will see in the literature what are known as arbitrary conventions of human nature rather than universal regularities. And the best way to give you this is as an example. Astrology in the West says, okay, we're going to use basically Greco-Roman planetary naming conventions, right? Mercury, the messenger of the gods, Venus, the goddess of love, Mars, the god of war, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so, you know, you take that the fourth planet from the sun is named Mars and he's named after this warlike mythical being. And so what you tend to get is the astrology sort of is based off the fact that when Mars does certain things in the various constellations, that has, you know, effects on somebody's aggression or conflict or something like that. Well, the thing you want to understand here is that's a, that's that's a that's an anthropomorphic naming convention. That's that's cultural. No other. I mean, there are there are a couple of other cultures that will have the fourth red planet named for something perhaps warlike or bloodlike or something like that. But that's certainly not every culture, right? Moreover, and just as importantly, the constellations, the way they're sort of drawn and named, are entirely arbitrary in a sense. And so. One of the things that you'll see here is that, that you, know, you know, this is this is some sort of a, you know, and a, a, a culturally specific thing that the, the idea relies on to be a successful idea. That's a huge, huge, huge issue with with something being a pseudoscience. All right. Next one is uh, another big red flag. And you see this with a lot of pseudosciences, especially back when I was a kid in the 70s. This was sort of the, the big thing. And it was what was known as evasion of risky tests. In other words, somebody would make a claim, say this was scientific, and, you know, it would oftentimes be somebody who said, oh, I can bend spoons with my mind, or I can do this, or I can do that. And, you know, the thing that was always great is they would go on a show like Johnny Carson, right? And Johnny Carson had been a magician at one time in his, in his career, and so he knew how to set things up so that you couldn't use trickery to achieve your ends, and, of course, the, the claim would fail. And the person would say, well, I can't do it in here because... There are too many people who are skeptical or the energy's not right in the room or something like that. In other words, you can't test the phenomena except in the conditions that the person making the claim wants you to test the phenomenon. And so that's a real issue. And if you see that, that's probably, again, another giant. I mean, anytime you see anything like that, that's just got to be the biggest con man or grift artist, you know, key flag that you're going to see there, right? Um, another way to say this is phenomena are often shy or fragile or jealous. They only manifest in the right conditions. Um, and so, you know, again, if you hear that, or if you hear somebody say, well, I can't do it because there are too many skeptics or too many doubters. Yes. You just walk away from the claim right there. I mean, it's just, you're done, right? Um, if you have some research on somebody when they're saying, oh no, we have tested this and you're trying to see whether it's a risky test or they're avoiding risky tests. Another thing that you'll see in there is you'll see that the research when it is conducted is sloppy or flawed or inconsistent, right? Um, you get all these sort of hearsay kinds of things like, you know, you get some mythological or, or ancient history. Herodotus said that this guy did this thing and that other thing happened. And I mean, we don't even know how much Herodotus made up or didn't make up, right? So, you know, um, those are the kinds of things that you really are, are big red flags. Another are retreats to the supernatural, and this ties in oftentimes with the previous point that I just made. Um, we've discussed in some length how science isn't allowed to consider supernatural agency in its, um, its methodologies at all, because those things just aren't testable, right? Something like this is going to absolutely fail Popper's falsifiability criterion, right? Um, 
that sometimes you get things to say, oh, they rely on explanations that can't be measured or observed. The supernatural influence of the planets named after Roman gods on people's personalities, you know, astrology, right? They, they'll sit there and say, yeah, this, this doesn't work, right? Um, references to magical or ancient thinking. Um, and this, the fallacy here is that the ancients knew more than we did. We've forgotten so much. And it's kind of like, really? I, you know, one of the things that I always say, the ancients weren't smarter than we were and the ancients weren't dumber than we were. You know, we're all human beings. We might have a leg up on technology that doesn't make us small, smarter, you know, looking back and saying they're ancients, that's just, that's an old medieval trope that sort of somehow makes its way into the world, right? Um, that we have today. Um, another one is the creation of mystery where nothing, where there isn't actually any mystery at all by omitting data or presenting imaginary data. Best example of this is the Bermuda Triangle sort of pseudoscience thing, whatever that's called, where that there's this, and by the way, you know, and you go and you look at a variety of different sources, the triangle gets defined differently, right? Um, depending on who you talk to, but then they say, oh, you know, you have this, this thing where they've got all, all of these, these strange occurrences where airplanes disappear into the ocean or ships vanish or all of this sort of thing. There must be something strange or alien or whatever that's going on with the Bermuda, Bermuda Triangle. Well, the truth of the matter is, is, if you actually look at the actual data, it turns out that in any of those areas that they, you know, sort of reference, there are actually fewer ships and planes lost there than there are in many, many other parts of the globe. But, you know, there just happened to be a couple of high profile cases that people have locked onto. And so you get this sort of selection bias thing that happens, right? Turns out the Bermuda Triangle has nothing strange going on with it once you actually look at the actual data. The ocean just is a really big place to lose stuff in, right? So, um... Another case on this sort of thing is you'll get arguments what's called lack of evidence or ignorance, right? UFL claims are a great example of this. We don't know how the Egyptians built the pyramids. Therefore, aliens did it, right? And by the way, you can imagine your favorite History Channel personality with the really great hair, aliens, right? Okay, that's a, that's a, that's a really common thing to see. Um, just because we don't know how something, you know, was done doesn't mean some fantastic thing had to do it. It just means we didn't, we don't know how it's done yet because we require evidence and we don't have that yet. All right. Another one is use of holism. The I, in other words, that the only way to understand a phenomenon is to understand every bit of it, that if you sort of try to break that thing down via some sort of reductionistic investigation by looking at the individual pieces and parts, you destroy the entire thing. The claim that we uh, that we read earlier about ion water is a great example of that where, you know, the person says you can't pull it apart piece by piece. You have to look at the whole thing. And of course, the whole thing is something only they supposedly have. Right. And so that's a, a real common thing that you will see is the use of whole whole holism. In other words, the fact that you have to look at the whole thing. Um in part of this, you'll also see some other pieces to this. You'll see that the field avoids drawing meaningful distinctions between phenomena um, or explanations that uh, you could be investigating. Um, you know, the thing is, is if, and again, we kind of mentioned this, if you, if you do show that a specific piece or a part of the, the claim is just not possible or scientifically fundamentally inaccurate or whatever the case, they'll sit there and say, oh, no, no, you can't just look at that by itself because it works in conjunction with all this other stuff. And so, you know, that becomes an issue. Um, seven, the, the, the seventh red flag is just the tolerance of inconsistencies, right? The claim ignore, ignores logical inconsistencies with the explanations of the phenomena. That's something you will see. Or there are lack of internal consistencies, either in methods of evidence gathering or in the results testing, right? Um, a great example of this is what you see oftentimes in astrology, right? You, you talk to five different astrologers and they, they, they say there are five different ways to, to do astrology, uh, to cast a horoscope properly, to interpret this thing in the horoscope properly. Um, there's just a, a, a real lack of internal consistency. They're not working with the same set of what you might call physical principles or, 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 you know, what you might call claim principles. And that's just a huge thing. If the, the people who agree that this stuff works can agree on how to make it work, 
then you got to have really huge questions. Um, another one is uh, proponents often ignore obvious contradictions. My favorite of this is has to do with the, the, the idea of dousing. If you're familiar with dousing, it's the idea of using some sort of, a, of an object to, to find underground water. Um, often used to dig wells and that sort of thing. And this is a practice that goes back centuries, if not millennia or before the history of time, um, whatever you might say. But, you know, you'll get some of the proponents will say, yeah, the only way that you can do this, you've got to find a, a forked branch that has been recently cut, made from wood, or it doesn't work. And then what they'll do is they'll, you know, they'll have some guy, they'll, they'll reference some guy who actually uses a forked metal rod that he forged in his, his, his workshop back at home and say, oh, look, see, he got it to work right. And there's just a massive inconsistency there. And so that's something that you'll, uh, you'll see. Another one will be appeal to authority. Again, this is something we've talked about quite a bit in this the second half of this this series on science's inquiry. Um, the appeal to authority. This is something we talk about in another episode that goes way back into you know Middle Ages or earlier. The idea that the author that authority has a greater weight than evidence as uh, the establishing of the truth of a claim. And so you know you'll be asked to believe something based on someone else's. Um, um, status in culture or society. So you get celebrities will endorse certain treatments, right? Or uh, that sort of thing. Or you'll get somebody who has this great reputation in one area being asked to endorse something in another area, right? So, you know, uh, my favorite one is your, you know, your favorite recently retired uh, football player endorsing in a, a healthcare product after their retirement, right? Um, last time I checked, most, you know, retired football players don't have, you know, advanced degrees in nutrition or kinesiology or exercise science or those kinds of things, right? Um, the other thing is, is that, you know, these authorities will oftentimes attack non-believers or skeptics as being closed minded or, you know, being having, you know, sort of, you know, something out for the thing or not wanting people to be any better or being part of big and then fill in whatever you want. You know, they're they're you know, they're part of big physical therapy. Right. And so they don't want us using these copper fit sleeves or whatever it happens to be. Right. And by the way, the folks there at CopperFit, I've never heard them say that. So let me be clear about that. But you'll get that sort of a thing that happens. Um, another one is you'll see that these folks are often motivated from ideological considerations, either political or religious. Probably the, one of the biggest ones that you'll see for this is con conversion therapy, right? Um, there is no scientific evidence that suggests that conversion therapy is at all successful. And there's quite a bit of evidence that's accumulating that shows that it's actually pretty harmful. And yet there are those who continue to push conversion therapy as a scientific practice because it lines up with their either their political or religious ideologies. And um, then, you know, they'll they'll say that if you don't line up with them, then you are not orthodox enough in some fashion, way, shape or form. Um, and so that's a you know, usually if somebody says, no, no, you need to you need to you need to get into this. You need to buy this claim because of my ideological stance or your purity on an ideological stance. That's a, a an exceptionally good um, red flag for the fact that their thing they're asking you to believe is actually pseudoscientific, not scientific. Um, another one will be in this. We, we talked about this a little bit is promising the impossible claims or, you know, unbounded by physical reality, things like endless energy or weight loss with no changes to any kind of lifestyle or no side effects or, you know, whatever the case may be. The thing you want to remember here is extraordinarily claim, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And these claims almost always lack that, right? Perpetual motion machines are a great example, right? Oh, I've got built this new machine and it's going to produce energy without using energy, blah, blah, blah. These things have been around. There've been, you know, con artists trying to get people to invest in their perpetual motion machines for as far back as Newton, if not farther. And, you know, they're always a scam, right? That's always pseudoscientific. Uh, another one, stagnation. And this goes back to that idea of making progress on problems, right? If you were looking at something and it's been around for, you know, a couple of hundred years, or in the case of astrology, a couple of thousand years, and it's not doing any better than it was 2000 years ago or 200 years ago in terms of, you know, making predictions, solving problems, whatever the case may be, however you want to evaluate that. That's a good, good indication that what you're looking at is something pretty pseudoscientific, right? It doesn't show progress in accumulating knowledge and it lacks evidence of self-correction in light of, um, new information, right? Um, 
there's no improvement in statistical significance. And so that's, um, those are some really big things. Some of the other things you'll see in folks that are sort of kind of adjacent to this is a lot of times you'll see reliance on outdated texts, right? If something claims to be scientific and then they reference a, a text that goes, you know, goes back to the 1600s, unless they're showing how that text then informs and moves forward into things that are being done now very clearly, and they're using that as a, a, a standardized text, that's a really good indication that there's been no progress made in that discipline, right, if they're, they're going back. And again, that's more, you know, you almost see the thing, the tie-in where they're relying on authority and some other things. The other is what I call the use of the Galileo argument, right? And the idea of the Galileo argument is, you know, there was all this establishment and Galileo was the one voice against the establishment and he turned out to be right and they were just repressing him and I'm just like Galileo. And, you know, if you re if you listen to our episodes on Galileo and that period of time in astronomy, what you know is that no Galileo was not standing alone against the 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 mass authority of the Catholic Church and all of those sorts of things. Um, that Galileo was in fact participating in a scholarly conversation, um, that that whole that whole sort of misrepresentation of the history of the fact is is something that plays into this. Um, Eleven, a refusal to acknowledge problems. Right, if you've got a, a a claim that you're looking at and you know there are obvious issues with it, and the proponents of the claim will not acknowledge those problems, that's that's a good sign that this is a pseudoscientific thing. Right, ignores outstanding issues. Um, or they make, this is the thing, is they'll make arguments from exceptions, error, anomalies, or strange events, which, you know, later on get validated, right? You know, so it's the thing that says, oh, well, you know, Bigfoot must exist because we've got this or that or the other thing. And then it's like, well, wait, we actually showed that this footprint was actually from this critter and we found a whole bunch more. Oh, well, but then, you know, let's, let's ignore that. Let's go on and talk about these other pieces of evidence. That's really good. Um, or the other thing you'll see is they'll say, hey, wait, but these guys don't have this solved, right? It's called deflection by pointing out other problems and other claims, right? Just because another claim may have issues doesn't mean your claim's right. And yet you'll get people who will make arguments of that sort in support of their claims. And if that's the case, that's a big red flag, right? Um, and then indifference to the criteria of valid evidence. That's our, our 12th and final red flag in this list, right? They don't really much care about whether, you know... Um, the valid evidence criteria, you know, means much. They don't really gathering evidence using rigorous methods. Oftentimes, use experiments that are just non-repeatable. You know, either because they won't they won't publish how they're doing the experiments, so no one else knows how to set them up, or they say, hey, you know, we happen to have this this very rare material that we're the only ones that are in possession of, and you don't have that, and so you can't do the experiment, kind of thing. Um, there's an, and this is kind of a really interesting and subtle one that a lot of people miss. Um, in this case, there's an over-reliance on confirmation as opposed to a focus on refutation. Remember, one of the things that comes out of, of Popper's idea of falsifiability is the sense that what you're trying to do is actually, you know, better experiments or experiments where the, where the people doing the experiments are trying to prove things wrong as opposed to trying to confirm that their hypothesis is correct. It is better to search for, you know, refutation than confirmation, because the, the idea there is, is that if you already have an idea and you already have some evidence that confirms your idea, new, you know, searching for additional confirmation doesn't make your idea any more correct. Trying to figure out a way to refute it. And then if you don't, you can say, hey, I tried to prove myself wrong or I tried to prove this claim wrong. The claim, the claim correctly um, predicted what would happen, even though I was trying to figure out how it could be wrong. That's actually a much stronger way of doing, um, um, of, you know, testing various hypotheses and that sort of thing. Um, use of negative proof. In other words, you, you can't show that it's false. Therefore, it must be true. Aliens, right? That's uh, that's a common thing. You can't show that there aren't aliens, so there must be aliens. No, no, that's not how that works, right? You, you, it's it's not about you know oh you know um, you know you 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 you've got to show that it's false. No, that the 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 the, uh, the claim must be shown to be true, right? Um, you'll see things like selection and confirma confirmation bias happen in in the data that's 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 used to support the claim. Um, there'll be use of proper propaganda or rhetoric or misrepresentation in the place of empirical ideas or evidence. And then sometimes you just see an absolute indifference to the facts. That's the Bermuda Triangle thing. You point that out, you show the person the fact, they don't care, 
right? Nope, nope, we just know this is going on because although in the cases that happened, they were weird enough that that doesn't happen other places. And you're like, but wait, I just showed you. Well, anyway, so as we finish up our list of uh, uh, red flags here, I, I hope you saw several of those things that you remember from the uh, Ion Water press release. In fact, let's, let's go ahead and read through that again, and maybe you can identify some of these. And we'll kind of go through this a little slowly um, and just sort of point out a few as we go along. So the, the press release started out in Health News Today, Atlanta, Georgia-based company Active Health Solutions announced the discovery of Ion Water, a new health water product. The company claims will provide a number of benefits for people who drink it. Nothing wrong there. That's just standard boilerplate stuff, right? Uh, the company's chief science officer, Peter Golo, Colligan explains how the project works, and this is what he says. He says, using magnetic resonance technology, Active Health Solutions has found a way to energize regular bottled water. Using our patented active ion technology, which is able to infuse dihydrogen monoxide with electrolytically generated nanobubbles, we have created a product that completely revolutionizes the way our bodies interact with and utilize water. Active ion uses tetrahedral mathematics-based technology, utilizing virtual lasers to achieve the resonance. By the way, I loved writing that paragraph so incredibly much when I wrote this quiz question for my students. And that is just all, you know, full of science babble, right? There is so much science babble that I crammed into that, that it's just startling. And that was on purpose. You know, I really wanted to show that clearly to my students, but you know, they've got magnetic resonance technology. They've got nano bubbles. They've used the, the bizarre chemical name for just regular old water, right? They talk about completely revolutionizing. There's a, there's a red flag. That's a little different one, right? That it's this extraordinarily claim, you know, it completely revolutionizes how your body interacts with water. What's the evidence? for that. Of course, there's no evidence. That's an extraordinarily extraordinary claim that there's no extraordinary evidence for. Um, later, you know, next thing we get the company founder, Dion Williams, points out or points to the ancient Greek mythology as inspiration. So they were going back to ancient wisdom kind of thing, right? That's a big red flag. We know the Oracle of Olympus is situated near the group of hot springs that was electrically active, et cetera, et cetera. We know Greek athletes paid enormous amounts of money. So this is all this going back to the past stuff, using outdated sources. And we don't even know if Greek athletes did that. By the way, this is totally made up there. I don't think there was ever an Oracle of Olympus that I know of. Um, perhaps somebody can, can fill me in. Maybe there was an Oracle of Olympus. And I'm just, I'm just, I, I miss that in my classical education training here. Right. Um, and so then we get the endorsement, right? Former Olympic hopeful Leon Ryan has been using the prototype for the product for the six months. Um, the product is simply amazing. Enthused the one-time competitive bobsledder. I've never had anything quite like it. When I drink ion water, I have more energy and focus. My concentration is better. Things seem like they slow down product is so effective that I'm seriously considering, okay, this is a, an endorsement, right? This is a, this is anecdotal evidence. There's nothing here that, again, this is a big red flag. They're not, reply, re, you know, there's no medical, here's our medical tests. Here's what, you know, athletes who use the, the ion water, how they did on, th on certain tasks. Here's how athletes who were given a placebo performed on those same tasks. And we see, you know, a 100% improvement to doubling, whatever the case may be. Right. So that's a, that's a big red flag. Um, note here a little later on, it says when asked if any other scientists have reviewed the research, the company uses a uh, of proprietary technology and can't be divulged until the patent applications have been reviewed, which by the way, they've already claimed that those things are patented. So what's going on there? But um, he said the company's done extensive testing of the product internally. There you go. Um, that means that, you know, they're not willing to share their data. They have dozens of athletes. Again, this is more anecdotal evidence, right? Um, and then back into the psychobabble, right? I think that people who try our product will really be surprised. We've managed to harness the energy's eth earth etheric energy. Again, this is like mythological stuff again. Uh, you know, create a new form of structured water. Well, if it's a new form of structured water, you should be able to demonstrate chemically how it's different or physically how it's different. No, they're not doing any of that. Um, when pressed, pressed about performing clinical trials, um, when the technology is robust enough to be moved out of our labs, that's a clear idea of a, a fragile, fragile kind of thing going on there. Um, we say that we're fairly certain our technology will only work in proper, properly in locations with strong magnetic field anomalies, et cetera, et cetera. Again, big red flags that go on there. Um, finally, it says, Mr. Williams said, this is really a whole package of technologies and discoveries. You can't just take pieces and parts of it and test them without disturbing the integrity of the entire process. That's that appeal or, or sort of claim of holism that you can't sort of reduce these things down, right? So 
you know, there's a, there's a good sense there that, you know, go through that and you really kind of can see what's going on. So again, let me emphasize that while this particular example is entirely fictional, this is entirely a fictional thing and any similarities to a product called Ion Water Now are co purely coincidental, okay? Um, I don't think you have to look around really hard to find numerous examples of these kinds of claims in everyday marketing and advertising. You really don't. For most of us, thought of having to dig down into a scientific claim is to determine whether it's truly valid is, isn't something we think we're going to have to do pretty often, right? That's just not something we kind of feel like, okay, look, you know, this is, this is this hard work to me to sit down and, you know, here's these guys from Fermilab making this claim about this thing. And I don't have the expertise to do that, but it turns out there's usually it's, yeah, this kind of stuff is a lot more right in front of you than something that's, you know, happening at a national lab or in some research facility in Antarctica or something like that, right? Um, they're right there. You know, when I've had my students do evaluations of various claims, we looked at stuff that's just in the in the public sphere all the time. Things like attachment parenting to conversion therapy, sociobiology. And, you know, it wasn't just things like phonology, you know, bumps on people's heads or extrasensory perceptions, but topics that engage a lot of people today, right? And, you know, the goal in, in the exercise wasn't to say that people shouldn't be allowed to practice those things, but to determine whether those things were scientific or not. And I will tell you, in every single case, the students came to the conclusion that those things were not scientific. It's not that hard if you apply a little bit of critical thinking or not to say, is this a pseudoscientific claim or is this a scientific claim? And that's something I think anybody and everybody can go ahead and do. So as we get towards the end of the episode here, let's focus on the why of these kinds of things. Where do they come from and why do people believe in them? Carl Sagan had this to say about it, quote, naturally people try various belief systems on for size to see if they help. And if we're desperate enough, we become all too willing to abandon what may be perceived as the heavy burden of skepticism. Pseudoscience speaks to powerful emotional needs that science often leaves unfulfilled. It caters to fantasies about personal powers we lack and long for, like those attributed to comic book superheroes today, and earlier to the gods. In some of its manifestations, it offers satisfaction of spiritual hungers, cures for disease, promises that death is not the end. It reassures us of our cosmic centrality and importance. End quote. I think that Dr. Sagan was, perhaps, being a bit ungenerous here, but maybe not too much. I might offer a linked variety of reasons that takes human nature into account, and these are presented in no particular order. People want explanations for things, and they want those explanations to make sense in a narrative way. There's been a lot of psychological research about this. Sometimes I think that the cold and personal language of, that science uses can be a bit hard for people, even a bit dehumanizing. Personal narratives or explanatory narratives that make us feel important really are attractive. People too, I think, want to feel connected to something bigger than themselves. To think that you're harnessing some ancient power or following the footsteps of some mythical hero can be deeply affecting especially when coupled with that narrative we were just talking about. People want hope, or at least a th sense that things can be better. Comforting lies will always be easier to believe than hard truths. People want to feel special, and that maybe they're in on a secret that only a few other people know about. Validation of being part of a group that shares a common belief is a powerful thing, as can be seen with conspiracy theories. As Sagan says, Skepticism is hard, and we tend to look for the easiest way through life because, well, life is hard. It would be easy to say that most people are just lazy, but I really don't think that's true. While there are certainly those who would rather just not be bothered to go through with the work of evaluating a claim, I think most people don't really want to be fooled or ripped off. It's just that it can be a lot of work to really go out and run down evidence for and against stuff. Sometimes the pseudoscience 
plays into our preconceived notions, ideologies, or biases. This becomes especially hard when authority figures of those ideologies or their affinity groups believe the claims of a pseudoscience. The same is true, by the way, for conspiracy theories. So what do we do? Well, I think at this point in this series, I think you probably know the answer to that. Be skeptical, practice critical thinking, and demand evidence. Remember, it's not your responsibility to prove any claim false. It's the responsibility of the adherents of the claim to show, via real evidence, that their claim is true to a reasonably skeptical person. Don't fall into the trap of having to show someone else's claim to be false in order to avoid believing in its truth. You have no obligation to believe somebody else's quantum woo just because they're one of your favorite actors or actresses, or they have a nationally syndicated TV or radio show, or if there's some huge social media influencer. Your job is to ask for evidence and then evaluate it critically. Also, realize that you don't have to make a decision about the truth of something right now. And that anyone that's demanding that you do that is probably trying to sell you something. As a way of wrapping up this episode, I think I would tell you to do the same thing I had my students do with their major projects in my science, pseudoscience, and snake oil class. Try to come to a conclusion that when the proponent of a topic claims that the topic is scientific, work on figuring out whether it's one of those three things. Is it science? Is it pseudoscience? Or is it snake oil? If it's science, it's going to meet the demarcation criteria we've set out in this episode and in previous ones. And it also won't raise, ver you know, either none of or maybe only one of those red flags. It isn't going to be, you know, something where you look at and you go, I just don't know, okay? If it's pseudoscience, it won't meet all of those demarcation criteria, and it's probably going to raise several of the red flags because they all sort of seem to be related to each other in many ways. It may not be actively harmful, but it's probably going to waste your money. In the ion water example, well, that's a really good one in this respect. It's just water. Drinking it isn't going to hurt you, but the extra three bucks the company tacked onto the price is probably going to go and fund their yacht rather than something you needed to pay for. Things like copper sleeves and magnet therapies and entertainment astrology and those kinds of things, well, they all fall likely into the pseudoscience category. I should say, though, that there are those who still push back against this kind of a thing because it really does muddy the waters. Pseudoscientific claims blur the lines between what's good and what's harmful, and they make false claims, things that they just demonstrably false, and that should always be resisted. And I really tend to understand that completely. If you tend to fall for the pseudoscience stuff, it's not much of a leap to end up in the next category, and that's usually pretty bad. The pernicious part of snake oil, and that's our third category, is just, it's just so awful, right? And by the way, we call it snake oil because it's, you know, it's kind of named after the sort of patent medicines that were sold in the United States in the 1800s and early 1900s that claimed to be cures for all kinds of things, but that actually had ingredients that were generally really bad for you. Besides just mostly being alcohol, right? That's what most of these patent medicines were. They had stuff like cocaine and heroin, camphor, you know, might have, you know, silver or arsenic or all kinds of other things in them that the people buying them didn't know anything about. And these days, where you can get stuff like that is wherein the pseudoscientific claim starts to replace what is an otherwise effective treatment or an effective thing with substitutes that are ineffective or harmful. An example of this that, you know, you'll hear about are, are miracle cancer cures, right? Cancer is just awful, right? And, you know, you, you hear it a lot, cancer sucks. And there's no question about that. And the treatments like chemotherapy and radiation often have really unpleasant, really terrible side effects. But at least they've gone through clinical trials, right? They've, they've had some level of established effectiveness, right, that you can have a conversation with a medical professional about. The problem with the miracle cures is that not only have they not done any of that, and so you don't know if they work or not, they substitute for things that have actually been shown to be effective. Even worse, there have been many cases where this snake oil has turned out to, you know, accelerate the progression of, of the type of cancer that they're claiming that they're going to cure. This is the medical equivalent of someone relying on an astrological horoscope to give financial advice. 
in replacing what is probably prudent advice from, you know, a, a licensed financial professional who's got oversight and all of those things, the horoscope-based approach is not going to have any better success than random guessing at best when making decisions about what to do with your money. And worse, it may give bad advice. In fact, you're probably going to be prone to give bad advice because it's not going to take into account things like market forces and economic trends and have philosophy about long-term versus short-term in investing and all of those kinds of things. Astrology for entertainment isn't a harmful thing, probably. But it doesn't take much to slip into using it to do some things where it may actually do some real harm, you know, using it to determine how you should handle your relationships or how you handle your money. In the same way, buying some water with a pseudoscientific marketing strategy isn't going to affect your health, but once you start making decisions based on that kind of hype, you open yourself up to the possibility of buying similar claims, and when I say buying, I don't mean maybe physically or actually, or maybe I do, I don't know, but of buying similar claims related to product that say they will heal whatever ails you when in fact they won't. As we wrap up, thanks for taking the time to listen to the show. If you know someone who might benefit from this, feel free to pass it along. If you're an educator who'd like to use this material, by all means. Attribution, of course, would be great, but this is information I've cobbled together over a 25-year interest in these sorts of things, and so, other than the ion water example, I'm not the originator of probably any of these ideas, so feel free to use this as however it works best in your classroom with your students. If you're enjoying the show and the content, please subscribe via whatever service you use to listen, and if you have a little bit of time, give us a strong review. There's always room for another member of the crew here on the Odyssey, so feel free to recommend this to your friends, your co-workers, whoever. We'd love to have them take a listen and join us in our journey. We have a Facebook group if you feel like joining us over there, and if you'd like to post an example of an ad campaign that you feel meets some of the criteria for pseudoscience, I think that'd be really cool. Just put them up there and we can kind of have a conversation about which criteria they do or, or don't meet in our, our list of red flags for pseudoscience. For those who would rather uh, you know, get your content over on YouTube, we have a channel for there now. Um, you just search on The Scientific Odyssey and you'll find us. We're still migrating episodes over and we'll eventually get there. But for the, at the time being, all of seasons one, two, four, and five are out there. So feel free to, to recommend that or, or, or send a link to that to the folks that you know that might really enjoy this kind of content. Also, a huge thanks go out to the folks at the Blue Dot Sessions who have, you know, for the longest time now provided the music for our journey. We really appreciate them allowing us to use their compositions. And finally, here at the Odyssey, we're happy to welcome a new crew member of our own. We brought home a golden retriever puppy named Quinn this weekend, and she's starting her journey with us. Right now, she's the tiny Quinn. We'll see if she becomes the mighty Quinn, though I have a feeling that may happen. The captain isn't uh, too sure what to make of the new cabin girl here on the Odyssey, but I can tell you, your navigator is definitely smitten. So until next time, full sails on your journey.